Hey, it's Chris. Welcome to the Square One Healing Cancer Coaching Program. This is module one, first things first. In this module, we're gonna do some broad brush strokes, an overview to get you started, and to change the way you're thinking about your situation, about cancer, and about your life. The very first thing you need to know is this. Cancer is a divine tap on the shoulder. And there's a message attached. And that message is, hey, the way you're living is killing you. The way you are living is killing you. Now, I'm not telling you that to make you feel bad about yourself. I'm not trying to put shame on you. What I'm telling you is now is the time to take full responsibility for your life. One of the most important things I did after my cancer diagnosis was to be honest with myself and say, well, maybe this is my fault. Maybe I had something to do with this. If I contributed to my disease, then maybe I can contribute to my health. We live in a cause and effect world and our choices matter. What you put in your mouth matters, what you put on your body matters, where you live matters, where you work matters, your choices matter. Cancer is the convergence of multiple health destroying factors in your life that all come together at the same time. The way you're living is killing you. Just go ahead and accept it. And if you go ahead and say, okay, this may be my fault, you know what that does? It empowers you. It empowers you to change. The cancer industry wants you to think it's not your fault. They want you to think it was just random bad luck and that nothing you did mattered. Therefore, nothing you can do matters, except showing up for surgery, chemo, and radiation treatments. But the truth is your choices can make the difference between survival and death. Whether you're doing conventional treatment or not, there is so much you can do to promote health and healing in your body, and we'll cover it all in the Square One course. The point is not to blame yourself and wallow in self-pity. The point is to accept responsibility for your situation and change everything you can for the better. I believe that everything in life happens for a reason. And most of the time, the reason is you. You are the reason that many things in your life happen to you. Not everything, of course, but a lot of things, because the decisions we made in the past affect our reality today. An easy example, the decision to consistently study in school results in better grades. Better grades result in college acceptance and scholarships. A college degree opens up doors for better career opportunities. All of our decisions matter. The diet and lifestyle decisions that you've made up to this point have all affected your health, whether you've realized it or not. And now we're going to make some changes. When we change the input, we change the output. Okay, so let's talk about the specifics of cancer. First, cancer is natural and it is normal. Every person develops precancerous and cancerous cells in their body in their lifetime, but not every person develops tumors. The difference between the person with cancerous tumors and the person with no tumors is their immune system. Your immune system is designed to identify and eliminate viruses, bacteria, parasites, pathogens, and mutated cancer cells. For a variety of reasons, cells in your body become injured. They can get DNA damage or mitochondrial damage, and when a cell becomes injured, it usually repairs itself or dies. But in some cases, that cell will mutate to survive. If it's deprived of essential nutrients or oxygen, it can mutate to become cancerous. Every cell in your body is programmed to die at a certain point. Some cells live for a few days, some live for weeks, some cells live for many months, but they all have a programmed lifespan. The cancer cell doesn't have that. When a cell mutates and becomes cancerous, it starts dividing uncontrollably, and it loses the auto self-destruct mechanism, and it keeps living and multiplying. Eventually, it forms a tumor, and then cells from that tumor leave and form new tumors in other parts of the body. That's the way we've been told cancer develops. But two studies on breast cancer published in 2016 found that metastatic cancer cells leave the primary site before the tumor is even big enough to detect. 
Generally, a tumor can't be detected until it's at least one millimeter in size. But by then, it contains between 100,000 and 1 million cancer cells, and it's been growing for six years. Stage one is metastatic. You already have cancer cells circulating throughout your body. This is why early detection is often too late and why metastasis happens after they tell a patient, we got it all. A properly functioning immune system is designed to identify and eliminate cancer cells. And if it's not doing that, if you have a tumor or lesion in your body, then that's an indication that your immune system is either overloaded or suppressed, or maybe both. It can't keep up with the demands you're placing on it. Cancer didn't invade you from another planet. These are your cells. Cancer is you. It's your DNA. Your body created it and your body can heal it. How do I know that? Well, besides my own healing experience, I've talked to, interviewed, and coached hundreds of people who've healed cancer. And many of their stories are much more remarkable than mine. I've met and interviewed many people who've healed stage four terminal cancer after chemo, surgery, and radiation failed them, and others who've healed without doing any of those treatments. If you know my story, then you know I had surgery, and then I chose nutrition and natural non-toxic therapies instead of chemotherapy. And my odds of survival as a young adult with metastatic colon, colon cancer, stage 3C, were, as my oncologist put it, very grim. I had less than a 30% chance of making it to the five-year mark and less than a 20% chance of making it 10 years. I firmly believe that the radical diet and lifestyle choices that I made made all the difference. My choices are the reason I'm here today. In the medical community, and especially in the cancer community, there's a long-standing belief that cancer is linear. That means once it starts in your body, it can't be stopped. It's like an unstoppable train. And the only way to stop the train is to blow up the tracks with destructive therapies like surgery, chemo, and radiation. But there's a lot of scientific evidence to the contrary. When cancer goes away on its own, it's called spontaneous remission. This is a medically documented fact. It's a medical term. They made it up, not me. In fact, there's a huge book called The Spontaneous Remission Project. It has over 3,500 references from 800 medical journals. It's the largest compilation of case studies and medical references of cancer patients who've had spontaneous remission. These were cancer patients who either didn't do treatment or the treatment didn't work, and then, for some reason, their cancer went away. We have scientific proof that the body can heal cancer. The medical industry calls it spontaneous remission, but we have another term for it, healing. Spontaneous remission means the body healed it. The body created it and the body can heal it. There are thousands of scientifically documented cases, not to mention all the wonderful testimonials online, but skeptics still like to say, well, that's just anecdotal. The truth is, we learn from the experiences of others. Those are anecdotes. And many of the most important scientific discoveries in human history started with an anecdote. Sometimes one anecdote is all it takes to change your life. When I started my healing adventure in 2004, the internet was not helpful. There were no good websites for healing cancer. There was no social media, no YouTube, no Facebook. All I had was one book. One man's testimonial, that was it. But that was all I needed. I knew it was an answer to prayer and it was enough to inspire me to change everything. Things are much better for you today. There's never been a better time to get cancer. <laughs> there are hundreds if not thousands of cancer healing testimonials online, on Facebook, on YouTube. There are over 50 on my site alone and I'm adding new ones all the time. Cancer can go away. It's called spontaneous remission. I want you to understand and believe that healing is possible. The body created it and the body can heal it if given the proper nutrients and care, which means 
you have to change the way you're living and remove all of the cancer-causing factors in your life. In most cases, cancer isn't caused by one thing. Many of you know the story of Erin Brockovich. She found out they had very high rates of cancer in her town because a local factory was illegally dumping hexavalent chromium and it was cont contaminating the water supply. And a lot of people were getting cancer. So in that case, they could pinpoint it to one thing, but still not everyone who drank the toxic water got cancer. So the good news is, even if you're exposed to environmental toxins, your diet and lifestyle can be protective but you still need to reduce your toxic exposure to the absolute minimum. I'm gonna show you how to do that in module four. Several recent studies have concluded that between 70% and 95% of cancers are caused by our diet, lifestyle, and environment. I'm gonna add a fourth factor, stress. I'll address that in module five, but for now, let's talk about the first three. Many researchers believe that less than 5% of cancers are genetic and that 95% are caused by diet, lifestyle, and environment. But even if that figure is closer to 70%, that's huge. 70% has almost everything to do with you. So let's talk about epigenetics. Epigenetics is a branch of science that studies how genes express themselves. So we know that not every woman with a breast cancer gene gets breast cancer. Why? Because your genes don't determine your fate. Your diet, lifestyle, and environment all contribute to whether or not your genes express themselves. We've all inherited some good genes and some bad ones. We want to express or turn on as many of the good cancer-preventing genes as possible. And you want to turn off or prevent the expression of the bad cancer-causing genes. Your diet and lifestyle behaviors and your environment can make all the difference. Your choices matter. There's a recent study that looked at multiple groups of twins. And what they found is that if one twin gets breast cancer, then the other twin has a much higher risk of getting breast cancer, especially if they're identical twins because they're genetically identical. But even though the other twin is a higher risk, many of them still don't get cancer. This further illustrates the point that it's not just about genetics. Genetics may load the gun, but your diet and lifestyle pull the trigger. So yeah, you may have a higher risk of cancer, heart disease, or diabetes if your parents or grandparents had those diseases, but your risk increases the most if you eat the same Western diet as them. So if you live the way they lived, you can expect to get the same diseases they got. If your mom got breast cancer and she had a Western diet and she didn't exercise, and then if you eat a standard Western diet and don't exercise, then yeah, you probably will get breast cancer too. But if you had a radically different diet modeled after the longest living people around the world with the lowest rates of breast cancer and you're active, then your risk of getting breast cancer will be much, much lower. The rate of breast cancer is six times lower in Japan than it is in the U.S. But when Japanese women migrate to the U.S. and adopt the Western diet and lifestyle, their rate of breast cancer eventually rises to the same level as American women. Your choices matter. Think of your body like a giant factory. The beginning of the conveyor belt, the entrance of the factory is your mouth and the parts coming into the factory are food. Food is coming into your mouth and down, going down the conveyor belt, which is your digestive tract, from mouth to anus. And along the way, workers in your factory are breaking down the food you eat and carrying the nutrients all around your body to give your cells what they need. The product of your factory is health. The goal of your body is to stay healthy, right? In homeostasis. Now, imagine a factory that's open 24 hours a day and the assembly line never stops and gradually the owners of the factory keep putting more stuff on the assembly line, but they don't hire any more workers. If you keep adding parts to the assembly line and you don't add more workers, you're going to create chaos in the factory. There's a classic I Love Lucy episode where Lucy and Ethel are working in a candy factory wrapping chocolates as they come down the conveyor belt. 
then the conveyor belt speeds up and they can't keep up and the candies are piling up and falling off and you know they're trying to get rid of the extra candies by eating them and stuffing them in their clothes so they don't get fired it's hilarious chaos this is kind of like what's happening in your body if you have cancer or any type of West, chronic western disease except it's not hilarious your body is overloaded and overwhelmed there's too much coming in too fast and your body can't keep up with the demands you're putting on it chaos ensues garbage piles up problems arise and everybody is working as hard and as fast as they can just to try to keep up with the demand but they aren't able to keep up your immune system is overwhelmed and it doesn't have enough capacity to deal with the rogue cancer cell that started multiplying and formed a lesion or a tumor or maybe spreading in your blood like leukemia or lymphoma what we want to do is we want to reduce the stress on your body reduce your toxic load simplify your life and create an environment where your body can thrive where it can prevent and heal cancer we want your body to be a place where cancer cannot thrive in the scientific community they refer to this as an environment that's inhospitable to cancer it's all about the terrain your internal terrain is either hospitable to cancer or inhospitable we want to make it inhospitable and there are major changes you can make to improve your internal terrain right now you are what you ate your body is essentially made out of everything you put in your mouth if you've been eating junk food and fast food for years well then your body is basically built out of junk it's clogged up and it's polluted and it's not running right but when you replace the man-made processed junk with high quality raw materials straight from the earth you dramatically change your internal terrain i'm going to show you specifically how to do that in the anti-cancer diet modules which is modules three and four now i want to switch gears there are two important questions that i ask every cancer patient and now i'm going to ask you the first one is why do you think you have cancer if you're taking notes write the answer down what are the reasons that you think you have cancer i think you know why you have cancer there may be some factors in your life that you aren't aware of yet but i'm also confident that there are factors you do know about if you think it's stress you're right if you think it's because you haven't been taking care of yourself you're right how do i know that because i've talked to hundreds of cancer patients and when i ask them that question they all tell me i haven't been taking care of myself and i've been and i've had a lot of stress in my life listen to your instincts and your intuition now your doctor is not going to ask you why you think you have cancer because most doctors don't care what you think if you volunteer why you think you have cancer to your doctor he's just going to shrug it off and say it wasn't your diet or lifestyle or stress it was just bad luck or bad genes if you have family history they'll tell you it's genetic i didn't have any family history and they told me mine was genetic blaming genetics is a way to make the cancer patient powerless the cancer industry wants to make you a victim, a helpless, powerless victim. A victim has no control over their situation, which means you must be fully dependent on doctors to save you. And there's nothing you can do to affect your future. No, it's, it's nothing you did. No, your diet doesn't matter. Yes, it's okay to eat ice cream, pizza, and burgers. You just need to make sure you eat enough so you don't lose weight natural non-toxic therapies won't help you we are your only hope that is the message that cancer patients are getting from their oncologists and i'm here to tell you it's a lie they're not your only hope your body created it your body can heal it the second question i ask every cancer patient is do you really want to live the first time someone asked me that it scared me because i'd never really thought about it I was so focused on not dying I wasn't really thinking about living and whether or not I really truly wanted to live so you need to answer this it's a yes or no question do you want to live because if you don't really want to live there's really no point in doing anything I mean, there's no point in changing your life 
There's certainly no point in doing surgery, chemo, or radiation. Maybe you're content with your life and you're ready to die. Or maybe you're unhappy with your life and you're just tired of living. That's okay. No judgment. If you're ready to die, that's totally fine. My suggestion to you is, why don't you just enjoy the rest of your life doing what you want to do? Like Norma Bauerschmidt, aka Driving Miss Norma, she refused cancer treatment at 90 years old, hit the road in an RV, and spent the last year of her life traveling all over the U.S. having adventures with her son and his wife. Norma wasn't trying to get well. She just made a decision to live it up to the end, and she died peacefully after a few weeks in hospice. I love that. If I had a loved one with cancer and they told me, I don't want to do anything. I just want to enjoy the rest of my life eating cheeseburgers and milkshakes three times a day. I'd say, okay, if that's what you want, I'll go get you some. <laughs> you know, you shouldn't do anything you don't want to do. Whether it's surgery, chemo, radiation, alternative therapies, whatever it is, if you don't want to do it, if you don't have that strong will to live, don't do it. But if you do want to live, you should know that beating cancer, healing the body, takes total commitment. Total commitment, no excuses. The characteristics of cancer patients that get well, like myself and hundreds I've met, are the same. We're all the same. There are two characteristics of cancer patients who heal cancer. One, they have a strong will to live. And two, they're willing to do whatever it takes to get well. They make no excuses. That's who this course is for. It's for people who have a strong will to live, who take full responsibility for their health, and who are willing to change everything. If that's you, then great. I am here for you. You are the person I am here to serve. But if you don't have a strong will to live, if you don't want to change your life, if you're not willing to quit smoking or change your diet or exercise or forgive, then this course is not for you. You must have a strong will to live and you must be willing to do whatever it takes to get well. I'm talking about taking massive action. Minimal action usually produces minimal results. Massive action produces massive results. Sometimes small changes can produce big results, but if that's what you're hoping for, your hope is in the wrong place because I will never tell you this one supplement or this herb or this one food is gonna cure your cancer. And anyone who tells you those kinds of things is scamming you. That's snake oil, the one cancer cure, the magic bullet. There is no magic bullet. Healing requires a total life change. You have to be prepared to take massive action and make a total commitment. I'm talking about at least two years. Two years, hardcore life change. I've seen a lot of cancer patients have dramatic turnarounds in their health in a very short time. 30, 60, 90 days, tumors start to shrink or even disappear, but a two-year commitment is essential because that's when you're at the highest risk of recurrence. Every cell in your body regenerates. You have almost an entirely new body every year. Nearly every cell has been replaced, some cells many times over in a year, but one year from now, you will basically have an entirely new body. That's pretty cool to think about. You are rebuilding your body. Every bite you take, you're building a new body. Remind yourself every day with every bite. I would think about that when I had cancer as I'm staring at this giant bowl full of vegetables. Some days I would have rather had a cheeseburger, but I reminded myself I'm building a new body. And that's what you have to be committed to do. At least two years, hardcore. There's a strange phenomenon that I see regularly, which is a cancer patient will adopt the hardcore diet and life change and do really well in the beginning. They feel great, the tumors start shrinking, or some tumors disappear within the first few months. And then for some reason, they get lazy and complacent and they gradually go back to their old habits and their old way of living. And then the cancer starts growing again or it comes back. Sometimes they become impatient that the tumors aren't going away fast enough. 
and then they let their doctors scare them and talk them into the quick fix of surgery, chemo, or radiation. And then the suffering begins. They're sick, they're weak, they can't eat, they can't get out of bed, and they get depressed and lose their motivation. And all the nutrition and exercise and health-promoting habits go out the window. And then the cancer comes back and their situation goes downhill really fast and it often does not end well for them. So let's talk about fear. Fear is a major factor here. I get it. I know what it feels like to be afraid of cancer, but let's break fear down for a moment. Where does the fear of cancer come from? It comes from the cancer industry because most people are afraid of suffering. They're afraid of the brutal treatments. They're afraid of being sick and poisoned and the damage that it does to their body and all the uncertainties and unknowns. They're afraid of all the complications that can come from surgery, chemo, and radiation. That's where the fear comes from. Most patients I've talked to are not really afraid of dying. They're just afraid of suffering. You need to be honest with yourself about what you're really afraid of and address that fear head on. If you're afraid of suffering from chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery, that's pretty normal. But remember, most of the fear of cancer comes from the cancer industry. And what I've got to tell you is, don't be afraid. Do not let fear dictate your decision-making process. Because when you're afraid, your stress hormones are pumping and you will make irrational and impulsive decisions. The cancer industry uses fear to motivate patients to take immediate action. They say, if you don't do these treatments, you're going to die. We need to start right away. And patients are rushed into treatment with fear. Remember, the cancer treatment industry is a business. This is a trillion dollar industry. And over the years, the oncology industry has figured out that if they don't book cancer patients into surgery or chemo or the next procedure before they leave the office, then there's a good chance they will lose that patient and lose that future income. For a short time, my mom actually worked in an oncologist office and her job was to book the patients for their next appointment before they left. It wasn't a sinister plot, it was just the way things work. A patient comes in, they get a cancer diagnosis, and then it's like, okay, now we've got to make sure we get them booked for their next appointment or procedure before they leave. Don't be afraid. Take a deep breath and breathe. You've got to breathe through this. You have time to read and research. You have time to change your life. You have time. Now, there will always be exceptions. If you have a tumor that's blocking your windpipe or your digestive tract, you may need immediate surgery. But most cancer patients have time. Many patients don't even feel sick when they get a diagnosis. You have time to read and research, you have time to change your life, and you have options. Don't let anyone rush you into anything you don't want to do. Don't make a fear-based decision. Listen to your instincts and your intuition. If you don't want to do a specific treatment, if something deep down inside of you is saying, don't do it, then don't do it. It doesn't matter if your family and your friends want you to, or if the doctor says you need to. Your instincts and intuition are powerful. You need to take the time to read and research and to change your life. You could experience a dramatic improvement in, in, in as little as 30 to 90 days doing exactly what I'm talking about in this course. I'm often asked if I would still have surgery knowing what I know now. And my answer to that is no, I would not have rushed into surgery immediately because my tumor was not life-threatening when I was diagnosed. I would have taken some time, 30 to 90 days, to change my life and give my body the opportunity to heal. And I would have closely monitored my progress along the way. We'll talk about the best ways to do that in Module 9, which is all about testing and how to monitor your progress. In my 20 questions for your oncologist guide, which is also part of this course, there are some critical questions to ask your doctor. And one of them is, is my cancer fast growing or slow growing? Chances are it's slow. 
you've had cancer growing in your body for a long time, many years. It didn't pop up overnight, so tell your doctor you need more time. I'd like to take a few months to get my life in order. I'm, you know, I'm not ready for treatment yet. And in many cases, they will give you permission to delay treatment. If they don't give you permission, then you have to decide whether or not you want to go against your doctor's advice. That's not as easy, but people do it all the time. Now, let's talk about the people around you. Because if you make a decision to delay or opt out of conventional cancer treatment, some people will not understand. They'll tell you you're wrong and that you're making a mistake. The first person that disagreed with me was my wife, Micah. She loves me, but when I told her I wanted to heal with nutrition and not do chemo, she thought I was making a huge mistake. And then other people around me, family members who loved me and wanted me to live, began calling and telling me I was making a mistake. And like many cancer patients, in order to appease the family pressure, I went to see an oncologist. When I asked him about alternative therapies, he said, if you don't do chemo, you're insane. The only person who supported me in the very beginning was my mom. She's always been a health nut and had stacks and stacks of books on health and healing. My dad was more of a stoic supporter, so he didn't put any pressure on me to go either way. He let me make my own decisions. But I had opposition from other family members and from my doctors. And if you have opposition, I just want you to know it's normal. You should expect it. When everyone else is floating downstream and you're trying to swim upstream, a lot of people are going to be like, hey, you're going the wrong way. So you need to be prepared for that. Some of you watching this are swimming upstream right now, so you already understand what this feels like. Listen to your instincts and intuition. That's the most important thing because that will guide you. Now, obviously, I'm a Christian, so I think you need to reach out to God and ask for help. God, help me. Show me what to do. I need encouragement and support and direction. Reach out and ask for help. Even if you don't believe in God or if you're not sure there is a God, just reach out and just say, okay, God, if you're real, you have my attention. Just show me what I need to do. Show me what I need to change. I'm listening. <laughs> and I can assure you that if you sincerely reach out that way and ask for help, you'll get it. Help will come to you in miraculous ways. It did for me, and I've seen it happen over and over again. But make sure you're looking for those miracles and answers to your prayer. Don't dismiss them or shrug them off as coincidence. There are no coincidences. During this process, you may need to have conversations with people around you who don't understand because they will continue to pester you and they will create a lot of stress and anxiety in your life. They'll keep saying, you really need to do the surgery or chemo or radiation. You, know, you really need to do what the doctor says. And at some point, you just have to sit down with them or get on the phone and say, listen, I know you love me and I love you. I know you care about me, but I need you to understand that I'm making the best decision for me. My goal is to live as long as possible and to get well. And I'm reading and researching and learning as much as I can so I can make good decisions. I'm not going to rush into anything out of fear. And I'm not going to do anything that I don't have peace about. When you explain yourself in that way, they will understand. You may need to say, you know, listen, I, you know, I understand what you think I need to do, but I really don't want to talk about it anymore because if that's all we're going to talk about, it makes me not want to talk to you. And I would love for us to just hang out and spend time together and not talk about this stuff and, and for you to just trust that I'm making the best decision for me. Sometimes a reality check is appropriate. If you've asked your doctor some of the questions in my 20 questions for your oncologist guide, then you will have some important details to share with your friends and family to get them to back off. For example, if you're stage three or four and you ask your doctor, will this treatment cure my cancer? And they tell you no, then you can remind your loved ones that your doctor told you it isn't curable. By the way, an incurable diagnosis can be a blessing in disguise because when the doctor tells you the treatment is not curable, that gives you permission to opt out of treatment. They've told you the truth, that they can't cure you, and that empowers you to take full control of your situation. And you can tell your friends and family, 
the doctors told me they can't cure me. All the treatments are going to do is make me sick and I'm going to suffer and there's no guarantee I'll live any longer or have a better quality of life. I'd rather change my whole life and try to get well that way. So, you know, I've got nothing to lose. And here's what you say to your doctor. Doctor, thank you so much for all the information and for your time. I've thought about this a lot and what I've realized is that quality of life is much more important to me than quantity of life. And if I do treatment, my quality of life is going to be terrible. I'm going to be sick and suffering right away. You know, I feel okay now and I just want to feel okay as long as possible. So I'm just not ready to do any treatment right now. Uh, something may change in the future and I totally understand if you think I have better odds if I do treatment, but it's just not what I want to do right now. If you explain yourself to your doctor in that way, they're usually more understanding. Uh, you should also ask if they'd be willing to work with you and on your own terms and order blood work every month, maybe a scan every six months or so. Typically your doctor will say, no problem, we can do that. Now, if you have an arrogant doctor who's a jerk and only cares about money, then they will probably still try to use fear to talk you into treatment. Or they might fire you as a patient, but good. Like, why would you want to work with someone like that anyway? So when you explain to the people around you that you just want to enjoy your life and feel good as long as possible, they'll back off. By the way, you don't need to tell your doctor everything you're doing. It's going to be a waste of time. You don't need to give your doctor a lecture about nutrition or alternative therapies because he's going to disagree with you and he's going to say, it doesn't work, don't do it, don't bother, or I had a patient who tried that and they died. So it's a waste of time and energy to go into any details about what you're doing with your doctor because chances are they haven't spent any time researching nutrition because all of their time is spent with patients or learning about new drugs. The vast majority of oncologists have no interest in nutrition whatsoever. So that's how you address the people in your life. The doctor, your friends and family. Get them on board or get them off board. You need to build a support system. A 2016 study of over 9,000 women with breast cancer found that socially isolated women had a 40% higher risk of recurrence a 60% higher risk of dying from breast cancer, and a 70% higher risk of dying from any cause. Don't withdraw and isolate yourself. You need friends now more than ever. Some cancer patients I've talked to had their spouse on board, their children were helping them, their parents were helping them, their siblings, their best friend, or all the above. They had an incredible support system, but that's rare. The best way to get people on board is to show them the information on crispycancer.com. Show them all the interviews I've done with people who've healed all types and stages of cancer. Show them the videos in this course. Try to open their eyes and help them understand that the body can heal and get them excited about the power of nutrition. Again, I only had my mom in the beginning. Then I found a nutritionist slash naturopath that has supported me. And then through him, I found an integrative oncologist who supported me. It took a little while for my wife to warm up to it, but she eventually did too. If you don't have much support in the beginning, it's okay. Remember, time changes things. It was even tougher for me because back then there was no social media. There weren't any Facebook groups. You couldn't find people on YouTube or Twitter. Those sites didn't exist. I had zero online cancer support, and there weren't any local alternative healing support groups in Memphis either. It's much easier to find support online today thanks to social media. There's a local healing cancer support group you need to know about called Healing Strong. People who are trying to heal cancer get together once a month to share their experiences, share helpful information, encourage each other. There may be a Healing Strong support group in your city. And if not, start your own. And people, the people you're looking for will come out of the woodwork. You can go to healingstrong.org to learn more about that. So you have to build your team and your support group. If you don't have anybody, you've got to get out there and beat the bushes and find like-minded people. They're out there. You don't have to do this alone. 
Go to your local hole in the wall health food store and tell them you're looking for other people who've healed cancer or are trying to heal cancer with alternative therapies. Ask for help and you will get it. The support groups you want to stay away from are the conventional cancer support groups. Stay away because birds of a feather flock together. And what you'll find is that traditional cancer support groups are full of cancer victims. People who are angry, afraid, and unhappy because they're suffering. And most of them aren't getting well. And they'll get upset when you talk about diet and lifestyle and alternative therapies. And they'll tell you what you're doing is wrong and that it won't work while conventional treatment is failing them. Don't think you're going to go in there and help them see the light. They don't want help. They just want to complain to each other. And they're going to turn on you. So until you're completely well, you won't be strong enough to handle this criticism. It's, it's going to create a lot of unnecessary negativity, stress, and anxiety for you. Just find like-minded people that you can support and who can support you. And you can exchange ideas and encourage each other. That's what you need. Next, make plans for the future. Document the entire process. Journal, do a video diary, start a blog. Document what you're doing because you need to plan to A, get well, and B, use what you've learned to help other people. You need life goals, future goals to work toward. Making plans for the future is very important. You know, the spirit, mind, body connection is a mystery, but something happens when you plan for the future. You're planning to live. You're sending signals of life to your body. It's very powerful. So don't be afraid to make plans for the future. I know some of you may be thinking, well, I don't know if I'll be here in a year or two years. Instead of thinking that way, I want you to think, I'm going to live. And these are my plans for my life. For next year, for the next five years, for the next 10 years, sketch out your life goals, the things you want to accomplish. I'm going to see my daughter graduate college. I'm going to see my son get married. I'm going to watch my grandkids grow up. I'm going to be a great grandparent. Making plans for the future is so important. When I was diagnosed, I didn't have any children and I wanted to have a family. I wanted to be a dad. It was in my life plan. But if I did chemotherapy, it was likely that I wouldn't have been able to have children of my own. That was one of the reasons I didn't want to do chemo. And now I have two beautiful girls. If I had done chemotherapy, my girls wouldn't be here and I probably wouldn't be here either. So make plans for the future. And the last thing is enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. Don't let fear and cancer steal your joy. Depression suppresses your immune system. It's a vicious cycle. If you're depressed and fearful and anxious and worried, it makes you more vulnerable to cancer. So you need to focus on things that bring you joy, hope, optimism, and encouragement. That's what the Square One course is all about. And you need to start living your life, really living. There's an organization for young adult cancer patients called Stupid Cancer. And even though they're very conventionally minded, I love their slogan, which is get busy living. Now is your time to live. You could die in a car wreck tomorrow. There's a hundred different ways you could die besides cancer. So there's no point in letting cancer paralyze you into depression and inaction where you just sit at home and feel sorry for yourself. Start doing things you've always wanted to do, like Miss Norma. Make plans, get out there, live your life, do fun stuff. Go skydiving, mountain climbing, and bull riding like the Tim McGraw song. Decide to enjoy your life and to enjoy the process and get busy living. Even if some of these radical changes are difficult for you, like giving up your bad habits and your favorite junk food to eat vegetables that you've never liked, You've got to keep your perspective. The fact that you can get out of bed in the morning, that you can see, that you can hear, you can breathe fresh air, you can feel the sunshine on your skin, and that you're alive, these are things to be thankful for. I talk about this a lot more in Module 7, about how to identify and eliminate the stress in your life, and how to stay positive and enjoy your life, but I just wanted to touch on that here. The overarching goal of the Square One program is to help you change your whole life 
and for you to enjoy the process. This is a new chapter. It's a new season in your life. It's a new adventure. So don't look at it like a chore. Don't look at it like drudgery. If you're focused on negativity and feeling sorry for yourself, stop it. Stop focusing on the things you can't do and start focusing on all the things you can do. Focus on all the things you have to be thankful for. You have a thousand things to be thankful for and happy about. Pick one. This will dramatically change your outlook and your mood. That's where joy comes from. It comes from gratitude. Gratitude is the secret to happiness. Practice gratitude every day. In module two, I'm going to help you connect the dots and identify the many factors in our world and in your life that are causing and contributing to cancer. And I will show you the steps you can take to systematically remove these cancer causers from your life, making it easier for your body to heal and also significantly reduce your risk of recurrence or of getting cancer in the first place. We're going to talk about your diet and lifestyle, your home, your work environment, stress, and a lot more. Don't miss it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on Module 2.